Praise God. Well, we are in part three of a series we started a few weeks ago that we called Accepted. Let's look at Ephesians, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. This says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. It says here, God made us accepted in the Beloved. In Jesus, we're accepted. The word accepted, it literally means He bestowed grace and favor on us. In Jesus. In uh, the Amplified, it says, So that we might be to the praise and the commendation of His glorious grace, favor and mercy, which He so freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. You can see, it says that he would that his glorious grace, favor, and mercy he bestowed on us in the beloved. In the Amplified it says, to the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, his son, Jesus Christ. In the Passion Translation, it says, For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades, cascades over us would glorify his grace for the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. Let's read that again in the Passion Translation. Well, before we do that, though, we see this is these scriptures, this verse, and you can see it clearly in these different translations. It's saying that God, through Jesus, because of Jesus, He put favor and grace on us. Notice it wasn't because of anything we did. It wasn't because of our family background. It's not because of our connections or how much money we have. It's because of what Jesus did in His death, burial, and resurrection that He bestowed grace on us. It's because of what He did that God is able to do that. It's not because of your goodness or my goodness or because we're so talented or any other aspect of ourselves. It's because of what Jesus did and what He bought and paid for through His death, burial, and resurrection that God is able to bestow mercy and favor and grace on us. Here in the Passion Translation, it says, For it was always His perfect plan to adopt us as His delightful children through our union with Jesus. See, it's not just, He's not just taking us in. God loves the whole world, but the a payment had to be made for sin. And so it is only through believing on Jesus that we're able to come into the family of God. It was always God's plan to send Jesus and to redeem us. To, to bring us into the family of God. It says that through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that His tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify His grace for the same love He has for His beloved one, Jesus, He has for us. This is an amazing statement. It says God has the same love for us as He has for Jesus. In other words, He loves us as He loves Jesus. Jesus, the spotless, sinless Son of God. In John 17, 23, it says this very thing. It says, I in them, this is Jesus praying, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in love, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved, you have loved me that you may know that you have sent me. This is talking about Jesus is praying. Let's read from the beginning of verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Saying, God has loved us as he loved Jesus. It's not, God doesn't love you because of all the great stuff you've done. He loves you because Jesus made it possible for God's perfection, for him to look at us and us to be redeemed back into the family. And our minds really can't wrap around this concept that God would love us just as much as Jesus. I mean, your mind, your natural, unrenewed mind stops there and says, how is that possible? How can that be? But we need to take the word for what it says and believe God. Because there's so many things you can't explain in the word. You can't explain in the universe how so many things have happened in your natural understanding. You know, we as a uh, human race are, are learning more and more about creation and about the universe, but there's so much we don't know. God knows all. And so if God says that he loves us like he loves Jesus, we, we can't figure it out. You can spend the rest of your life, you're not going to be able to figure that out. You're just not. You can't, you can't logically come to a conclusion. But you can accept it by faith and believe that God because of what he did in Jesus, can accept us as being right with him and that he actually loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. Well, if that's the case, if that's true and we accept it as really true, that'll change the way we look at life. That'll change the way we look at any circumstance because if I'm in a circumstance and I'm thinking God's way out there, far away, doesn't really think much of me, that's one thing. But if I, if I believe, truly accept that He loves me as He loved Jesus, well then, what is there in my situation that He wouldn't do for me? What is there in my situation that He's not going to uh, help me with? See, what, what it's our problem there is, we bump up against the rationale of that, and so we have trouble really accepting it. See, you don't accept it with your head, you accept it with your heart. That's the problem. Your heart can accept it, but we got to get our head out of the way. Because it's one thing to mentally assent, mentally agree with what the Word says. It's another thing to believe it and act on it, act like it's true, act like God really does love you. Because you could say, oh yeah, I know God loves me. I know he's accepted me, but then act like you're on your own and, you know, you're in a situation and there's no way you're going to get through this because you just don't know where the you know, money's going to come from or you don't know, you know, how you could possibly, you know, work out this relationship or whatever it is. Well, but if we really believe God's accepted us, we're in his family and we're in union with him and he actually loves us as much as Jesus, well, then these other questions are actually pretty dumb at that they don't make any sense they don't line up with really believing what God has said about it it doesn't really make sense to worry about how all these little things will, will happen on the earth if we really believe that we're accepted and in God's family and he loves us as much as his one and only son if we believe that we're gonna our behavior will change and that's why we need to renew our minds that's why we need to look to the Word. That's why we need to let the Word of God be our authority and not what we feel or we think or what we see because that's subject to change and that will press on you and it will try to convince you God doesn't love you. Yeah, I know it says that, but what? just look. God doesn't love you. And we have to let the Word of God penetrate our hearts so we accept it. And as we do, we, our behavior is going to change. We'll start approaching situations differently, saying, wait a minute, God's with me, He's for me, He loves me, so, and here we go, and expect something different. See, that's faith. That's believing God will do what He said. Let's look at Matthew 
It says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, God is saying here, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay. What did we just read about us in relation to Jesus? He is pleased with Jesus. What, first of all, the Bible says that faith pleases God. So what do we know about Jesus? He was walking in faith. He believed God as he's walking in the earth. Well, we, the Bible says God loves us like he loves Jesus. So what do we need to do? We need to believe what God said about us and our relationship with Him. We need to believe. It, it's easy to believe. Well, I think it would be easy to look at the, you know, what we just read. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's, it's pretty easy to accept that. God say, why? Well, I, accept, I accept my Son. Well, it's like Jesus. He's perfect. Of course He accepts Him. And we can try to mentally accept that he loves me, but the, the rubber meets the road when we're dealing with real life, with real situations, with real, real problems. And the more we are anxious, the more we are in turmoil, the more we're upset about these things, the more we understand that we really don't have it in our heart yet what we're talking about here. Because if we, if we really believe God is well pleased with me, he loves me, what, what do I have to do? I have to believe on Jesus. And I have to continue to walk in what He said. These scriptures we're reading that were accepted in the Beloved, that through uh, what God did, that were made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We need to believe that that will cause you to live at a higher level. If, if you start thinking it's all up to you and, and it's only what you do, we have a part to play. Our part is to believe God and walk in what He's told us to do by faith in Him. But if we start thinking, now i got to earn it somehow, it's subtle. Satan is subtle. Regardless, whatever area, he starts getting you to, to follow a pattern of, of, of striving and works. It doesn't matter if we're talking about believing God itself. He can get you into works in that. That it's, you know, I'm just trying to believe God. Why won't such and such happen? Well, what, what is happening there is we've taken our eyes off what God has said, and we are starting to look at what we're doing to try to do, to believe God, instead of believing is a choice. We look at, just like what we're talking about as far as believing in the love that God has for us, it's a choice to say, I don't understand that. I don't see how that's possible, but I choose to believe it. With my heart, I choose to say, I, I take that. I believe it. Well, that will cause our behavior to change. That will cause our, the, our perception to change. We'll start saying, wait a minute. I believe Him. I'm accepted in Him. I, it's not something I have to do. I'm just going to walk with Him. He's going to show me what to do. He's going to show me how. He's going to show me where. He's going to show me you know, with whom I'm supposed to be hooked up. And I'm going to walk through, and He's going to bring me up and through because He loves me. And that is what our job is, to walk His plan out, loving Him, believing Him, and trusting that He actually cares for us, just like He said in His Word, accepting it by faith. Some of you say, I don't feel like I'm accepted. I don't feel like He loves me. It has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with being saved, coming into the family of God. If somebody were to, to approach you, and let's say, you know, if you're a Christian, if, you know, this is what we're talking about here. If you were a Christian uh, already, and somebody were telling you they're not a Christian, you're saying, well, they're saying, well, I just don't feel like God would accept me. You would tell them, it doesn't matter if you feel like it, Jesus died, that if you believe on Him, you would be accepted. They could argue, oh, I've done this, this, I just don't, but I don't feel like it. Again, you probably come back, well, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Your feelings don't have anything to do with what God did. God said it, and so that's it. Either is tr say, telling the truth or He's not. It doesn't really have anything to do with if you feel like it or not. You know, if I told you, you know, you needed a ride somewhere, and, and Shelly and I said, well, well, you know, you can say you, your car wasn't working or whatever, you need a ride. And we said, well, we'll pick you up. You know, let's say it's 4 o'clock on a Thursday. 
We'll pick you up 4 o'clock on Thursday. All right. Now, if you got to, you know, get close to that time and say, well, I don't, I don't really feel like they're going to do it. I don't, I don't feel like it's true anymore. Does that have anything in the world to do with us picking you up? What you feel about it? It has nothing to do with it. You could feel, I just, I just don't feel like they're going to come. I just don't feel like they're going to pick me up. What does that have to do with it? You feeling, what, you, you know, ate something for lunch and your blood sugar is falling and now you don't feel good about something or what? It doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, with God, it, it has nothing to do, our relationship doesn't have anything to do with our feelings. So if we're going to approach God by feelings, we're going to be all over the place. Feel good one day, ooh, God's great. Don't feel good, oh, just don't know where he went. Well, God didn't move. So if you were, just, if you were talking to somebody about being saved, being born again, you would tell them your, your, your feelings don't have anything to do with it. If you call on the name of the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you would be saved. You would tell him you do that. You believe it with your heart. You do what the Bible says. Your feelings don't have anything to do with it. Well, after we're born again, after we've walked with God, it's the same thing. Just because you maybe get into a, a mindset, that's why we don't go by feelings. You start feeling like, well, where did God go? Or I don't know if he'll do this. It has nothing to do with what we feel. It has everything to do with what God has done through Jesus. Just because we might feel like he's distant or feel like he doesn't love us has nothing to do with the fact that he is there and he loves us. Just like he said. And so we need to come to him and say, God, right through it. If, if, if we will come to him in the middle, if we get thoughts, because everybody gets thoughts. Everybody can have feelings come on him. They, nobody's immune from those things coming to us. It's what we do when they come to us that counts. If they come to us, thoughts of, I don't know where God is. I don't know if he'll, he'll take care of me. We need to push past the feelings and just come to God and say, Lord, I don't feel a thing. I, you know, if I'm going by my senses, I don't see how or what or, you know, sometimes we, we think, other people, they don't ever have any feelings, you know, about stuff. It's just, well, it just, you must never have any challenges or feelings. It's just, everything's always working. No, every, the feelings come to everybody. It's, we just got to push them out. The thoughts come to everybody. Brother Hagen said, um, he, he would say, if I went by feelings, I wouldn't, when I get up in the pulpit, I wouldn't preach 75% of the time. I would have you pray for me. I wouldn't be praying for you. If I'm going by feelings, I'm like, I, don't, I, I, I feel like I'm not equipped to preach. I feel like I don't know what I should say. I'm, I'm saying this is what Brother Hagin was saying. I've experienced that. You can do it by faith. But sometimes we think, You're ha I, I'm having a feeling, but nobody else ever has those. Are you kidding me? If they're walking, if they're breathing, if they're human, it doesn't matter. You name anybody on the planet. I don't care how long they've walked with God. They are going to get hit with thoughts and feelings. Satan didn't take a vacation just because somebody's walked with him for 20 years. No. He is going to try to... If Satan is a wicked being, and he's persistent. If he can get... If he can bring a lie to somebody, and they'll accept it, he's going to go for it. And see, what he does, he just tries to go around the perimeter just trying to bring different things. Oh, rejected that. Oh, rejected that. What about this thing? Oh, got a little bite. They were, they were thinking about it. They were processing it. He'll push on that. We got to know to say, wait a minute. No, doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what I feel. I believe God. Don't make the mistake of thinking everybody else has it together or they, they never have any thoughts because then what you'll say is, I'm having this thought and so I'm different, and so then you'll entertain it, thinking that somebody else, they just don't get them. No, it's not that people don't get them, it's what they do with them. We have to, they may be going through more stuff than you're going through, yet they're not letting it penetrate, and they're pushing it off. You can't go by what you see, or you think, you don't know anybody's life. You don't know what other people are going through. I mean, you may know but some people that are close to you, but even then, you know, you don't know deep, inside, and it's certainly people that you just see at a distance, Satan will lie to you and tell you, well, that, you know, 
They don't ever deal with this. You don't know that. Satan's a liar. We need to believe what God has said. And if he, when we come to him, we need to believe as a Christian then, when we're walking with God, you know him through his word, number one. And you get to know his spirit and how he leads us. Part of that is getting to know His Word. The same way He speaks to you in His Word, when I say, I'm not talking about an audible voice, but talking about the impression and how He leads us, is the same way He's going to lead us by His Spirit for things that aren't in the Word specific, like where do you go to live, where, who do you marry, such like that. But you get to know God through His Word. We fellowship with Him through His Word. So if His Word says something, we need to say, God, I believe that, I accept it, it's true. And your feelings maybe say, it's not true. You're crazy. It's not true. You know he doesn't love you. Or, and you, people say, oh, that's silly. Hey, it doesn't matter what you say in your head. It's what you do. And if you're in a situation and you say God loves you, but you're feeling like he's abandoned you because you're acting like you don't have any help, in reality, we don't believe it at that point. So we need to push through it and say, wait a minute. No, God accepted me and is accepting me now based on what he's done, and my job is to have faith in him, believe his word, and act like it's true, regardless of anything else. Have confidence in that. It's accepting what Jesus has done, and walking in that, that will cause us to walk at a higher level. We need to stay and stick fast to that. Look at Romans 5.17. Praise God. See, Satan will try to get you separated. This may seem basic, but the fact is people get into the family of God by simply believing Jesus, and over a period of time, Satan will try to separate you from the simplicity that's in the gospel, try to get you separated from just believing God and trusting in His Word and get you over into some form of trying to maintain God's favor. Now, of course, you do what God has told you to do. We ought to go after them, but that comes by faith. If we'll believe Him, we'll do what we should do. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. It says, verse 17, For if by the one man's offense, talking about Adam, death reigned through the one, so if death could come in through Adam and reign in the earth through Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace. So we're talking about in Ephesians 1, it said that we're accepted in the beloved. That's literally that God has bestowed His grace and favor on us through Jesus. Here it's saying those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. See, it's a gift. Righteousness is not just a religious term. It, it means justification or being right with God. If we could, it says, it, 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 the person that receives abundance of grace and the gift of being right with God will reign in life through the one Jesus so if we receive what God has done and what He's provided through Jesus, then we'll reign through Jesus. In the CEV version, it says, Death ruled like a king because Adam had sinned. But that cannot compare with what Jesus Christ has done. God has been so kind to us, and He has accepted us because of Jesus. So, and so we will live and rule like kings. Because of us? No, because of what Jesus did. In the Amplified Classic, Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, lapse, offense, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with himself, will reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Notice it's saying, let's read it again. In, uh, let's pick up 
Let's just read the beginning because it's not really another good place to pick it up. So verse 17, the beginning, an Amplified Classic. For if because of one man's trespass, lapse of, uh, or offense, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and unmerited favor. Notice it's saying the people, those that receive His favor and grace. What is that? You're accepting what He's done. Not trying to figure it out, not trying to work for it, but accepting what He has done, His overflowing grace, His unmerited favor. In other words, you accept that you're accepted. You accept that you're in union with God through Jesus. You accept what He's done. You receive it. You say, okay, well, I receive it. Have you ever had somebody offer you something or give you a gift? You know, let's say they, they say, I wanted to do such and such for you. Or maybe they say, I bought you this. And you thought, why, why did you do that? No, you don't have to do that. I don't, I, that no, that's, that's great. That's so nice. Or they said, I want to do it for you. And Well, that's, that's awesome. But you don't have to do that. I mean, you could talk them out of it. You could try to say, I, I just can't. No, I can't receive that. I, for whatever reason, no, you don't have to do it. You ever see two people? I mean, you've been involved in a two fighting over paying the bill at a restaurant or something. Haven't done too much of that lately, you know, at restaurants, but, you know, we've all seen that. You know, somebody could want to do something for you, and you could reject it. You could say, no, no, I, I, that's too nice, or I can't. How, are you, how would you actually partake of what they want to do for you? You would have to receive it. You'd have to accept it. You'd have to say, all right, man, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Thank you for getting my meal, or thank you for what you, you know, bought for me. That's, that's so nice. Thank you. But you could not receive it, and guess what? You wouldn't have the benefit of it. They wanted to do it, or even they did do it for you, but you wouldn't receive it. You wouldn't accept it. And some, you know, your mind can say, well, I would, I mean, I would never reject stuff. I would never reject something good, or, you know, of course, if God did something for me, I'd receive it. This is exactly what we're talking about. See, we, it's, doesn't, it's not so obvious. Satan doesn't come up to you in a red suit with a, fit, a pitchfork and say, I am Satan. I'm here to cheat you out of what God has already done for you. Now, he loves you, but I'm telling you he doesn't. So believe me. He's really accepted you, but, you know, you shouldn't believe that. You should believe me. I say he doesn't accept you. It's not going to be like that. It's not going to be, you'd say, of course, you're an idiot. Get out of here. I believe God. That's not what happens. He tries to bring subtle accusations to you to get you to, to disconnect with what God has already done for you. God has done it. He's saying in his word, it's yours. Uh, believe me. I've accepted you. I love you. Uh, if you'll believe me, I'll, I'll do everything I said in my word. But we can go, ah, oh, that's too good to be true. But we won't do it so obviously to be like, I just, I don't feel like God loves me. Well, you just disconnected yourself. What does that have to do with it? You just disconnected yourself. Well, but I mean, I got, if I do this, this, and this, then I feel like I'm accepted. And you, don't, you wouldn't, might not verbalize it, but it's like, when I do this, then I feel qualified to receive. So then maybe you do something, right? And then you feel like you can receive. So now you've gone into receiving mode because of something you thought you had to do, when in fact, you could have just gone into receiving mode to begin with and said, I don't get it, I don't understand it, seems too good to be true, but I believe you, God, in spite of your feelings, you don't let them talk you out, you don't let circumstance talk you out, you just said, I am accepted, I, I, I am going to receive what you did for me. I'm going to accept it and believe it. And sometimes that takes pushing through stuff because thoughts may come to you, circumstances may come to you, things in your, up, your upbringing may come to you and try to talk you out of just saying, it's mine. But notice here it says uh, that those who receive God's overflowing grace and His unmerited favor, those who receive, that means you got to take it. And the free gift of righteousness. See, it's free gift of us being right with God. Putting them into right standing with Him. Then they will reign as kings in life through Jesus Christ. 
the ones that receive it. It's not the ones that it's been done for because actually Jesus has bought and paid for the sins of the whole world, but it's only those who believe on Him. The Bible says in, in, uh, in Corinthians that we are ambassadors reconciling the world to Him because through, through Him that He's already paid for it. But it's only those that will receive it that are going to be born again. Well, that's true. Only those that will receive Jesus are going to be born again and saved, but only those that receive it in everyday life, even as a Christian, are going to actually walk in what He's provided for. Same thing. In other words, you could get into the kingdom of God, believe God, believe that God rose Jesus from the dead, get in because you received it, but then a whole lot of other stuff that He's actually provided, not receive those things and stay right there. In other words, got into the family, but that's it. Not receiving what He's done. But it's only by receiving what He has done for us that it is made, uh, actuated in our life. That's faith. How do you receive it? By faith. We access what God has done for us by faith. Faith is the hand that takes from God. It's not, faith doesn't make it available. Grace makes it available. We had a whole series last year called uh, By Grace Through Faith. And I, if you didn't hear those messages, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. God's grace makes His blessings available to us. We didn't do that part. We didn't earn it. But by faith, you receive them. Faith is the conduit. It's the mechanism whereby we receive what, what God has already provided through Jesus. But you receive it by believing that He did it. But you didn't make it available by believing. He did that through His grace, and now you believe and receive. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 says, But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It says Jesus became for us these things. He became for us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. In other words, if you don't boast in the fact that you did any of that because you didn't do any of it. Jesus, God did it through Jesus. Jesus was made these things for us. All we can do is receive, is accept. In other words, we didn't make the terms of the contract but we can add our name to the contract and say, I'm going to get in on that. I accept it. I believe it, and I act like it's true. Now, let's look at, um, we're going to go to Philemon, but in going there, let's look at Ephesians 1.3, where we, came, we read this right at the beginning of our main uh, verse of Scripture, but I want to touch on this as we're going into Philemon. Ephesians 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. See, He has blessed us. Has is past tense. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Christ. So because of what Jesus did, we're blessed with everything we need. In the NLT, Ephesians 1, 3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. He's blessed us because with everything we need, every spiritual blessing, in heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ, because of our relationship with God. What do we do? We accept that. We acknowledge that. We say that's true. I acknowledge that I have been blessed. What if you say, I don't see anything? Well, does that make God a liar? God said, I blessed you. And you say, no, I'm, I, don't, I don't feel blessed. I don't see myself being blessed. Well, what are you doing? You're contradicting God. Does that, make, does that mean God didn't do it? No, God's done it. It's just like when we were talking about a gift. 
Somebody could say, I've done this for you. It's ready. And you say, I, I don't believe it. I, I don't feel like that's true. No, that's too much. You, you can do without. That, does that mean they didn't do it? No. It means we're not receiving it. The way we start walking in what He has done for us is by receiving it and acting on it and believing and saying it's true. So let's go to Philemon 4. We're going to look at this verse, these verses, in some different translations. We act on God's Word and say what He says about us and say what is true regardless and in the face of anything else. We say what He has done for us in Jesus. It says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Verse 6 says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. In the Amplified it says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become, of more, become effective and powerful because of your accurate knowledge of every good thing which is ours in Christ. Notice that because of your accurate knowledge of every good thing which is ours in Christ. Could you have something and not know it? Of course you could. I mean, if there's part of your house that you haven't touched for a while, or, you know, a closet or something, you could have something and not be sure where it is. You could know you think you have it, but you're not sure. You know, you could inherit something and not know everything, all the details. We have been given so much through Jesus, but it becomes active, it becomes effective when we acknowledge what we have. We find out about it, number one, because you could be walking around not knowing what God has done. That's why we're preaching on this. How does faith come? It comes by hearing the Word of God. How does light come? It's by, the, by God's Word. The Bible says the entrance of His words brings light. So light is shining. We, we start to find out, wait a minute, you mean through God, through what God did in Jesus, I have these things? Well, now when we hear that, now we need to act and receive it, not reject it, say, no, it's true, and believe it. In the Amplified Classic, it says, And I pray that the participation in and sharing of your faith may produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours in our identifi in identification with Christ, Jesus, and unto His glory. That's a mouthful. Let's read it again. But notice, it's talking, it's bringing out. The Amplified, it amplifies the thought, you know. It shows all the different kind of angles uh, that you could take in looking at this. It says, I pray that the participation in and sharing of your faith may produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours. Now, before we read the rest of the sentence, it's saying that, that we may fully recognize and appreciate and understand and have precise knowledge of every good thing that's ours, not just in and of ourselves, but it says every good thing that is ours in our identification with Christ Jesus. So we would have a full picture of what is ours because of our relationship with God through Jesus, that we would know and acknowledge and walk in what we have, not what we're going to have, not what we have to earn, but what we have. Why? Because we're so great? No, because of our identification with Jesus. Because we're connected with Him, we have been given certain rights and privileges. Jesus, God said, we just read in Ephesians 1, 3, He said, I blessed you with all spiritual blessings. 
God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. But we need to find out about them. We need to know what they are. And we need to agree that they're true. Because you could have, we could have these things. They're sitting. They're ready. But we say, I just can't take it. That's not receiving it. That's not acting on it. And it says that we're going to have these things effective as we acknowledge that they're true. It didn't say when you feel like they're true. It didn't say acknowledge them when it's sunshiny and everything's going well, and then you say, isn't God good? Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. It says you acknowledge it. Well, that would be whenever. That could be when it looks like none of it's true, and you want to cry, and you want to run away, and you say, God has said, and you quote what he has said, and believe what his word has said, he loves me, he's for me, and you say, whatever applies to your situation, you believe God loves you just as much as he does Jesus. He's accepted you in Jesus, and you, in, you acknowledge those things. Whenever you feel confused, or it feels like things are dark, it's put, trying to push in on you, you start acknowledging what you do know. Let's say you're facing a situation and you don't know quite what to do. One of the worst things you can do is talk about what you don't know about the situation and start going around in circles saying, I just don't know what we're going to do here. I just don't understand this, and I don't understand that, and I don't know here. Because you're, you're focusing on what you don't know in the darkness, and that will just... You, you know, you can, if you start down that path, you think you're just touching it, but pretty soon it just gets darker and things you didn't think about that you didn't know. Now you're, you're feeling like, I don't know that either. And oh my gosh, I, I forgot this. And it just gets dark. But if we'll, instead of doing that, acknowledge what we do know and acknowledge who God is and what he has done. And you can acknowledge what he has done before and say, God, I don't know about all this stuff, but what I do know is I'm saved. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm saved. And I know you. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, which you should be, you say, God, I thank you that I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I know you. I have the power of God re residing on the inside of me. Lord, I thank you for all the times you've led me. I know you led me here and you led me here and you've guided me, you know, all these years. However far back you can go, you can say, Lord, you did this. And you acknowledge these things are true. And you acknowledge what God has promised in his word. And just focus. Read it if you have to. Read it out loud. Get your Bible. Get a sheet. Print out scriptures. And you don't feel like something, you just start reading the word of God. Don't start saying the other stuff. Just start saying what God has said and read it out loud. So it forces your, hear, your ears to hear it. And, and acknowledge what God has said about you. You know, I have a list of scriptures that I read uh, some or all of those nearly every day that have spoken to me in the past and they cover different subjects and I will go over them. And it is nourishment. You need to have things that have nourished you. All the word of God is good, but there are things that I can look back on that list and I, they, it will bring back certain times and circumstances in my life where I saw this. And as I read it, that comes back and it just brings back the, the, the word is life-giving and, and um, enlightening. And the presence of God, when you read the word, is, is, is uh, so tangible. It doesn't, you're not looking for a feeling, but we're talking about spiritual, spiritual nourishment. But you, you go back and look at what the word says. Remind yourself of the things that are true in the word. Acknowledge what he has said. See, spiritual things are like natural things in that. You aren't going off today. You're not being sustained off of food that you ate a year ago. Or even last week. Now, we are what we eat. In some ways, there's some part of something that has contributed to where you are. But I'm talking about energy. I'm talking about you actually operating. You're not operating on what you had last week. You needed to eat something today, and if you haven't eaten something today, you're going to eat something today, likely, unless there's some special reason why you're not. You're going to be eating. You're going to be feeding yourself. Why? Because it brings strength. Because it brings nourishment. Because you have the calories in you and the, the nutrients in you to do what you need to do. And just because you knew a truth in the Word of God, 
a year ago does not mean it's vital and current in your life. That's why we need to go back over the Word. And as we acknowledge what He has said and, and remind ourselves of what He has said, that becomes, that, that's a power source in our lives to go through and to believe and to walk out the plan that God has for us. Let's read this in the Passion Translation, one more translation here. It says, I, Philemon 6, I pray for you that the faith we share may effectively deepen your understanding of every good thing that belongs to you in Christ. That we would have a deepened understanding of everything that does belong to us. It belongs to us, it's ours, but we acknowledge it. We say it. We say it's true. We say it's true when it's sunny, when it's cloudy, when it's dark, when it's light. Whatever is in our, our, our sphere, whatever we're facing, we say what God has said and we acknowledge that it's through Christ. And that doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what He has done in the past, He will do now. And what He has said in His Word is ours. So we receive it. We acknowledge it. And we walk in it to His glory. And we glorify Him and give Him the praise as He does what He has said in His Word and is able to make real what already belongs to us. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you.